Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. It's very good to see you this morning. Um, I know there are a few of us, and with it being uh, a holiday weekend, that might explain the slim attendance, but that is just fine. We know that it's not about numbers, it's about quality. So without further ado, um, we will begin. And speaking of that, um, our June potluck, inshallah, we will be sending out a notice about that because it looks like it's going to probably have to be on, I believe, the 24th, but we will post it once we confirm all the the dates and everything, and we are planning to have it at our home uh, in this uh, month coming up in uh, June. So we'll look forward, inshallah, to seeing all of you there. Please continue to pray for um, Claudette and Gennard as new parents and for Angelica and Megan and Camila who are expecting. May Allah uh, make their childbearing days easy and comfort them and their adjustments that they're going through uh, in that kind of, um, in the time and that season of their life, inshallah. So I also would be remiss not to mention the great time that we had last Sunday at Dr. Shahada's home. And uh, every year she tries to sponsor one or two events for our organization including other similar organizations or folks involved in da'wah, inviting uh, people to Islam. So I certainly am very grateful uh, for them and for their continued uh, support of what we do, alhamdulillah. So I'm just going to make Maysoon the co-host, inshallah. And there we go. So we're going to continue today, inshallah, and build on the nobility of the heart through power. Uh, approaching this, obviously, is the power that we operate from the Quran and the Sunnah, or is it from our ego? And we're going to take this another step and even look deeper at the spiritual heart and the manifestations, realizations that can come from it. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'kuru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina may yahdih lahu fala mudilala wa min yudlil fala hadiyala wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la Wa ashadu anna muhammadin abduhu rasulu amma ba'd. All the praise is due to Allah alone. We seek Allah's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our souls and bad deeds. Whom Allah guides will never be led astray, and whoever Allah leads astray, no one will ever guide. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity, but Allah as a wajal exalted be Allah, the one having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's final slave and messenger. Ya yuhaladina amanu taqu laha haqattu qattihi walla tamotunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who have believed, fear Allah is Allah alone should be feared and do not die except as Muslims in submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal nas utaku rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nasa'a wa taku la alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna laha kana alaykum rakiba. O people, be dutiful to your Lord, who created you from one soul and created from it its mate, and dispersed from both of them many men and women, and fear law through whom you demand mutual rights, and revere the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever over you, Arachib, an observer. 
Yehuludina Amanu Takulaha Wakulu Kalan Sadida Yuslilikum Amalikum Wayak Filikum the Nubukum Wame Yuta Ilaha Rasuluhu Fakad Bowls of Bowls on Avima. O you who have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. Allah will then amend for you your deeds and forgive you your sin. And whoever obeys Allah and Allah's messenger has attained a great attainment. So last week, again, uh, Dr. Shahada, as I shared about one exemplar of the nobility, that essential nature, that fitra of the human being, the spiritual heart and the nobility of the heart through power, the fuel energy derived from that heart of our nafs and what we realize because of it. As seekers of the divine, we focus on elevating our ranks by returning our spiritual hearts to their original state, the state that it was in when it was introduced into our mother's womb at 120 days of the gestation. So we are striving to connect to our heart, not our brain, our delusional brain. In Surah Arun, verse 30, which is also the 30th chapter of the Holy Quran, so set thou thy face, thy personality, the self, the countenance, steadfastly and truly toward the faith, the religion established by Allah, adhere to the fitra of Allah's handiwork according to the pattern on which Allah has made or created humanity. And this is why we were made and created in the best of molds, not because of our egos, but because of what Allah put in us, that God infusion. No change let there be, no altering in the work of creation wrought by Allah. That is the correct standard. That is the correct straight religion, the Surat al-Mustaqeen wrought by Allah as a wajal. That is the correct standard straight religion, but most among humanity understand it not. Again, that fitra is the natural inborn inclination of humanity to worship the one creator before the corruption of their nature by external influences take place. Islamic monotheism is described as the religion of fitra, that of the inherent, inherent nature of humanity. What is our power or fuel source? Again, we ask the question, is it the Quran and Sunnah or our egos and nafs, our desires? We don't need as much gas to talk as we do to walk. To maintain and materialize the spiritual nobility Allah as the Wajel gave us, we have to have tried and tested spiritual experiences whereby Allah's inspired word and speech and sunnah of his final messenger are the authority in our lives and the answers to every spiritual question that we have. And by the way, because we are spiritual beings, everything is a spiritual question. We are spiritual beings with a physical body, not physical bodies looking for something spiritual to, to create. It's already there. The Quran constantly reminds us that taqwa, righteousness, or God consciousness is the sole criterion of human dignity, purity, and righteousness. So nobility, that nobility that we spoke of last Sunday, is much more profound than what we covered. In fact, according to the Quran, nobility does not lie in the color of one's skin. And so in the Western world, people began to decide who was cultured, who was noble, and nobility tended to usually be around people that had money, they were considered noble, not people that had spiritual richness. But according to the Quran, which is our guiding book, not what the world says, not what we're taught by the brain, nobility has nothing to do with the color of our skin, our bones, our DNA, our ancestry, or the material achievement, achievements we have made in the dunya. 
people will often say this is a very noble person based on their judgments because of things that person did. Nobility is from Allah. In Surah 49, verse 13 declares truly, the noblest, listen to what Allah says about this, not what the world says. Truly the noblest among you in the sight of God is the most righteous among you. The one who has taqwa. Remember that righteousness is based on taqwa. And so therefore taqwa must be understood as the constant working of faith, iman, in one's life. It is because I see God in everything, and in everything I see Allah, that I want to begin everything I do with Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God, the merciful and the compassionate. It is a generic quality that activates one's life under a true consciousness and mindfulness of divine presence. Seeing Allah in everything. It is that generic quality that activates one's life under a true consciousness and mindfulness of divine presence under which one moves, stands, and deals with other beings. This consciousness may vary from time to time, hence those people of Taqwa, the Mutaqeen, and here again we see a rank. We are not just Muslims, but we are the Mutakis. We have elevated from just believing to just being the doers of peace, to being the doers, the possessors, the manifestors of taqwa, of respecting Allah in all that we say and do. The consciousness, as I said, may vary. Remember, Iron Man fluctuates like the laundry, fluctuates like 40 times a day. So even though this consciousness may vary, those people of taqwa, the mutaqeen, they're not a sect, they're not a religious order, they're not a particular class in society. They may, may be of a particular class or rank with the law, but not in society. We are spiritual beings, and our approach should be the approach of living in a spiritual world. Through their abidance of Islamic virtues, the mutakis, the individuals acquire the pleasure of Allah because they do see Allah in everything. And they see everything, everything they look at, they see Allah in it. And this confers upon them a place of dignity, honor, and love among Allah. And listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, the angels and humanity. And you ask, where do you get that? Imam Sykes, where do you get that? Where do you get that? And I'll tell you because I have a proof for that. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, explained this by saying, when Allah loves someone, he calls Jabrail and says that he loves that person. So he says to Jabril, so that you also hold them beloved. I love them, I want you to love them. Jabril then loves them because Allah said so. Remember the angels never question Allah. And then these, this angel, this beloved angel proclaims that person, them, among the inhabitants of heaven. Behold, God loves that person, so ye also hold him beloved. Now Jabril is telling the inhabitants of heaven, you love that Mutaki, that one who sees the law and everything. So the people of heaven love him or her. And then honor and accept. Acceptance is placed for them on earth. So in the marriage contract, kabul is the acceptance. So there's the offer, and that word in Arabic is uh, escaping me right now. I want to think tabul, but don't hold me to that. 
But kabul is the acceptance. And that's a requirement of marriage. So Allah, we ask. I'm sorry, Imam. I, I just wanted to, it's takabul. Yes, takabul. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, Allah, we ask you for your love and acceptance, for Jibreel's love and acceptance, and the people of heaven and earth to love, see, know, honor, and accept us. The Hadith gives the order of honor and nobility in human society. Nobility on earth follows divine acceptance in heaven and not vice versa. And that's something that we should deeply do to dabber on, deeply contemplate, reflect on, and find out what the tefakr is, what is the resolve when we deeply contemplate on something that way. Any acceptance or nobility which does not proceed from the consciousness of divine presence, presence, presence I'm sorry, or through the spirit of taqwa is not true nobility. And this is where we get deluded by the brain. It is not nobility and greatness in the sight of God, and therefore it is devoid of Islamic recognition. You see, the opposite is ego recognition, iconic ideologies, and self greatness. He or she is an icon, and therefore the brain says they must be noble people. It's not what Allah says. If the intellect of the heart knows that. It is only Allah that gives nobility, and we seek nobility through Allah in a place where the angels and the people of earth and the inhabitants of heaven are asked to love us from Allah and command it, and they will. Human progeny proceeded from one man, and this is the beauty of this, as is the Quranic view. Existentially, Whatever its ontology, it implies that all humans are equal. Process this for a minute, my beloved brothers and sisters. Allah gave us all the same amount of nobility in that fitra. It is up to us as to whether we develop, manifest, realize it, and elevate our ranks in that nobility so that we inherit the love and honor of the angel Jabril and the inhabitants of heaven and the inhabitants of the people of earth. The Quran states very clearly in Surah An Nasai, verse 1 Mankind, be mindful, be aware, be conscious of your sustainer who created you out of one living entity, and out of it created its mate, and out of the two spread abroad a multitude of humanity, men and women. You see the equity of biological origin here that Allah has given us. We all start with affirmative action with an equal opportunity with Allah. And that is through the God infusion, the fitra that Allah has placed in us. We do not reach nobility if what we do for others is not done solely for the sake of Allah. If what I do for others is so that they will do for me, that is a physical, earthly manifestation of satisfying my desires and my ego. It's not about my soul, is it? We will not gain Islamic nobility if we do things because of ego ulterior motives. Human brotherhood is thus a real one with the embryo being the nobility which Allah placed in all of us. We all trace our ancestry, our genealogy back to the same father. Therefore, none of us is superior to the other one. We don't have to say, well, my father was a doctor and my father was a physicist and my father was a farmer. My father was Adam Salam, who received the God infusion and that changed and transformed him from a lump of clay to the first prophet of God. You see, 
My beloved brothers and sisters, the Quran does not deny differences in human beings regarding their color, language, race, and country. It affirms and recognizes these differences. But in the Quran, these differences say something of the greatness of Allah rather than the greatness or superiority, superiority of one's self, color, language, race, or nation over the other. The Quran beautifully announces in Surah Arum, verse 22, and among his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variations in your languages and your colors, truly in that are signs, ayat, for those who know. I am always amazed as I have traveled in numerous countries to see the various colors of sand on different beaches. Even in Florida, the red sands of Ormond Beach, the white sands of New Smyrna Beach. And then there are various places in Florida where the beaches are very gray. And there are places in the world that I've been where the beaches, the sand is almost black. Again, in Surah 49, verse 13, Eliza Wajel says what means Mankind, we treated you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know, identify, not despise each other, but know and identify, understand each other. Quranically speaking, it is not the difference of color, for that is the creation of God, but it is, it is demonic color prejudice. Evil does not lie in the differences of race, nation, or tribe because human beings are so made and appointed by Allah, but it is racialism, tribalism, and nationalism which are the source of evil. And you see, that's thinking. That's how people think from their brain, not their heart. If they think from their heart, they will recognize that every single human being, regardless of the pigmentation of their skin, came from the same father. We are all brothers and sisters, equally. And often it's in this nationalistic kind of thinking, this tribalism, racialism kind of thinking, these isms, that actually these things actually cause shed. Because we begin to say what we believe instead of what Allah has said about this. And that is a form of shark. We worship our nationalistic cultures more than what Allah and Allah's messenger said. So much so that after reading about this religion for five years, embracing this religion, the first time I was exposed to Muslims, I actually thought I was in the wrong place. I thought, this is not what I read about. And the more I was around, the more I recognized that something's wrong here. And I thought it was all me. Many people worship their nationalistic culture more than what Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his speech during the Hajjat al wadda the farewell pilgrimage, declared people descend from Adam, and Adam was made from dust. There is no superiority in dust. There is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab, neither for a white man over a black man, except the superiority gained through this is the intellect we want to have in our heart. And if we walk in this earth with that in our heart and our desire to please Allah by manifesting that, which Allah is, we would not have the racism that we have in this country. Let's get back to Islamic nobility. 
the world of physical bodies is subject to the angels. So that when at Allah as a wajel, the mighty majestic one, command, they deem it appropriate to see humanity needs it. They bring rain in the springtime across the winds from animals in the womb and plants on the earth and bring them to fruition. This is, or there is, a group of angels responsible for each one of these tasks. The human spirit that shares the essence of the angels also has been given the power. And remember what the name of this lesson in last week's lesson was, the nobility of the heart through power. The human spirit that shares the essence of the angels has also been given the power to subject some of the physical bodies of the world to itself. So this is correlation between angels and humanity and humanity and other things in the earth. This is all my beloved brothers and sisters about power and control. What do we use our power for to satisfy our desires when the brain's five senses tells us, oh, that looks beautiful. That smells great. It's pepperoni pizza, but it sure does smell good and I want it. That's brain work. The heart work is, that's pepperoni. I'm not going to take it off and then eat the pizza because it's still going to have pepperoni residue on it. I'm going to obey my Lord. The human spirit that shares the essence of the angel has also been given the power to subject some of the physical bodies of the world to itself. Every person's private world is their physical body. And the body was created to be subservient to the heart. The heart is the king of the castle. Every single extremity of the physical body that we've been given is supposed to obey the heart, not the brain. It's supposed to obey, obey the heart where our fitra resides, where we are connected with Allah. Every intention of man begins with the heart, and this is from authentic ahadith. So every per person's private world is their physical body, and the body was created to be subservient to the heart. Pre-filled with knowledge and recognition of Allah and Allah's oneness. That's the fitra. That's that God infusion that we received at 120 days in gestation. It is evident that the heart is not in the finger, nor are knowledge and will. But when the heart commands it, it moves at the heart's command. See, this is the power I'm talking about. What are we doing with our power? Is our power coming from the Quran and the Sunnah? Is our power coming from our nafs? When the image of anger appears in the animal soul from the adrenaline, sweat pours out from the seven limbs as though it rained. When the image of carnal appetite appears in the heart, the instrument of carnality swells of that animal nature, that carnal nature, that part of us that does not receive spiritual things. The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit for they are foolish to him. The spiritual person receives things from the spirit because the spirit part, the heart, is filled with that knowledge, that ilm. When we think, or when it thinks of eating, that faculty under the tongue becomes activated and begins to salivate and drool to moisten the food so that person can eat and digest it well. It is no secret that the control of the spirit flows through the body and that the body is subjected to the heart, core, nature, spirit, essence, energy, power, and soul. 
Know that some spirits nobler and stronger, nearer to and more resembling the angel's essence be obeyed by other bodies external to it, so that should they all, should their all of a law because of what's in their heart affect the lion, the lion will become abject and obey them. When the prophet, may Allah be pleased, be upon him, that was thrown into the fire, said Allah, make it be cool. It was made cool. That fire was subjected to the heart of that prophet. A horse whisperer might be Allah knows best an example of this. That, if you've ever seen a horse, the way they look at you, and this is why we have Iqban therapy, equestrian therapy. I think it's why I rode horses in high school because I could look into their eyes and I knew they could look at mine and they could nod. There was something amazing about this connection. This spirit influences based on the criterion of Allah and Allah's messengers. If a sick person acquires hope in what Allah has said, and they trust the law and they accept it, they improve. But when we resist the color of Allah, when we resist a blessing, a gift from Allah that is called a test, we don't improve because our nafs are saying, I'm angry. I'm not getting what I want. My ego is not being satisfied. Allah loves to fulfill the desires of his suppliants. And the more they remember Allah, the more Allah remembers them. The power I'm talking about can be used for positive and constructive or negative, harmful, and destructive things. Even within religion, I can take the words of Allah, and if I use them for the sake of Allah, I can do great things. I can take the word of Allah, take it out of context and manipulate people and do very destructive things. All of this is possible when intellectual proof, with intellectual proof and is evident through experience. That which is called the evil eye and that which is called sorcery is of the harmful, negative, and destructive kinds of power and are the effects of a person's spirit on the bodies of others. So that should that spirit be mean and envious, for example, to have envy and jealousy in their heart, see a fine steed and out of their jealousy imagine its destruction, the horse can die immediately. Abu Naim narrated the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the evil eye is real. It causes the man to enter the grave and the camel to enter the cooking pot. And of course, I will explain what that means to you inshallah. But again, this is why we want our heart to be pure. And by the way, this thing that we call the evil eye that is purchased in so many countries, highly populated by Muslim, is shirk. It's haram. No one should want to have these in their home if they're on right guidance. Only by ignorance we would have these things in our home. It is understood from this hadith that the evil eye affects not only human beings, but all living beings and even everything that attracts one to look at, like plants. And this is really amazing. But in, when we lived in California, um, there was a Muslim there that had this beautiful plant growing in their home on a trellis. It was just beautiful. And we went back to that home and the plant was dead. And we said, what happened to your beautiful plant? And that person said, all I know is that someone came to visit and they said, if only I could have that plant in my home. Allahu Allah knows best, but perhaps that envy 
the power in their heart of destruction caused that plant to die. And I'm sure that there are those folks that are in the class with us today that might have stories about this. And if you'd like to share it at the end of the class, that would be great. Abu Na'im narrated that the messenger of Allah said the evil eye is real. It causes the man to enter the grave and the camel to enter the cooking pot. It is understood from this hadith that the evil eye affects not only human beings, but all living beings and even anything that attracts one to look at, like plants. This is the reason why stunning women might wear in the cab, because people might be envious of their physical beauty. The Arabic word al ain translated as the evil eye, refers to when a person harms others with their vision or gaze. And this is real, folks. It is a term that describes misfortune transmitted from one person to another out of jealousy or envy. It starts when the person likes a thing and then their evil feelings affect it by repeatedly looking at the object of their jealousy. The victim's misfortune may manifest as sickness even, loss of wealth, family, or even bad luck. The person inflicting the evil eye may do so with or without intention. Allah commanded his prophet Muhammad وسلم, to seek refuge with him from the envier. Even this perfect man was told by Allah, seek refuge from the envier. As he said, Interpretation of Ibn al Qayyim, Rahimallah, Rahim Allah, sorry, said it is as an error shot by the one who is jealous or is known for giving evil eye towards the one who is envied, hitting the target sometimes and missing it sometimes. If it is encountered while uncovered and without protection, then the person is affected by it. We don't have to worry about the evil eye. If we are always remembering Allah, we will be in the protection of Allah. But no doubt, if it is encountered while taking precautions, it will not affect us. Indeed, this era, evil eye, may be returned to the owner himself. And this uh, is found in one of the scholarly books, Zayd al Ma'ad, uh, volume four, I think it's opinion 154, if I remember correctly. The Quran, Sunnah, and reality confirms that, and it, the evil eye, cannot be denied. This too is one of the marvels of the marvels of the powers of the heart. If such an exceptional quality appears in a person, and I don't mean exceptional in a positive way, if they are those who call the people to faith, I'm sorry, I actually do mean a positive way here. If this quality of remembering Allah and having that spiritual grace, it is called karama, favor or spiritual gift. Karama is something extraordinary that Allah calls us to happen at the hands of one of Allah's close friends. There are many differences between mu'ajiza, which means miracle, which is only reserved for the prophets, and the karama, including the following. So just remember, be reminded that 
Mu'ajizah is the word for miracles in Arabic. It is only reserved for the prophets. Humanity does not have the capacity to possess or perform miracles, but Allah will give to some people karamat. This capacity that these favor, they, they have this power because of the purity of their heart to prevent destruction through actions, through their very knowledge to be protected. There are many differences between Mu'ajiza and the Karama, including the following. The Mu'ajiza is meant to be done openly and be seen and known by many people. The one for whom it is done, the Prophet Sallallahu is enjoined to show it openly. Whereas the Karama is based on concealment and the one for whom it is done, the Wali or close friend of Allah, is enjoined to conceal. So if by Allah's grace and mercy, we ever have a karama, because of our connection with Allah, we do not go and tell people. That is our private worship. That is something that we hold so dear in our heart if Allah ever blesses us to see it. Number two, a challenge and claim of prophethood may accompany the Mu'ajiza, whereas the Karama is not accompanied by any challenge or claim of virtue or high status before Allah. So if you are a believer that Allah has blessed with an experience of Karama, you don't run around thinking you're better than any other believer. It's in fact, it will humble you. You will be so humbled because you will want to guard what Allah has let you see. And you will not want to brag to others for that could cause envy. The fruits of the Mu'ajiz that benefit others, whereas Karama usually only benefits the one to whom it is given. And sometimes Karama might be the healing of what we would call in the world of terminal disease. It can be many things, but this could be an example. Where Doctors and every professional in the world will say there's no way this person will ever walk again. There's no way this person will ever do this and that. But Allah gives that person something. Only Allah knows, to my knowledge anyway, if someone is given this. The Mu'ajiz may be an extraordinary event, the parting of the seas, the breath blown into a figurine that takes flight. The Mu'ajiz may be any extraordinary event. The Karama can only be a few types. The Mu'ajiz is only for the prophets, whereas the Karama is for the close friends, the Walids of Allah. The prophets use their miracles, their Mu'ajiz to establish proof against the Mushrikeen because their hearts were stiff, hard, and rigid. They were allowed to see something that would turn their hearts in the right way. This is why we pray, O Allah, the turner of hearts, turn our heart in your direction, in the directions of that God infusion, in the direction of your ilm, not my brain. And this six points I found in a master's thesis entitled all we lay while Karama fi al Aqida al Islamia by Muhammad Khair al Umar. There are also several other differences between the Mu'ajiz and witchcraft, including the following. The Mu'ajiz is something extraordinary, it occurs contrary to the laws of nature and comes from Allah. May Allah be exalted. As for witchcraft, it happens according to rules that the practitioner of witchcraft may learn. And this is again about power. Humans have the power to do witchcraft. And that's because of what is in their heart. It's not aligning with what Allah put in their heart. The Mu'ajiz results in nothing but good 
whereas no good comes from witchcraft. It appears sometimes that good came from it because we're judging it with our brain and not the intellect of Quran and Sunnah. The Mu'ayjahs that cannot be concealed, you can't hide the power of Allah, whereas witchcraft can be undone or withdrawn. It is well known that witchcraft can only be done by seeking the help of the devils and drawing close to them. The Mu'ayjahs that occurs at the hand of a prophet who is the best of people in knowledge, deeds, and attitude. In contrast, witchcraft happens at the hands of the practitioner of witchcraft, who is the worst of people in knowledge, deeds, and perspective or attitude. People are put off by them and those who keep company with them. But you have to have this knowledge in order to protect yourself. There is no cause for the Mu'ajisa. Hence, no one other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can do anything like it. As for witchcraft, it has well-known reasons which are spoken or written incantations. And they use the jinn to do it. They employ the world of the jinn who are getting close to heaven and taking messages from the angels and bringing them down to the earth. And the Hadith says they're right. I think it's one out of a hundred thousand times. Anyone who learns that and does it will get what he wants from witchcraft. In the case of the Mu'ajiz, it cannot be obtained by learning and experience. It is from Allah to Allah's prophets. Some of the scholars' comments on the difference between Mu'ajiz Karama and witchcraft, I thought I would share with you. Al Alama As Sa'di, may Allah have mercy on him, Rahimullah said, the difference between the Mu'ajiza and Karama and extraordinary devilish things that happen at the hands of magicians and charlatans is as follows. The Mu'ajah is that which Allah causes to happen at the hands of messengers and prophets of extraordinary events, of extraordinary events with which they challenge the people so that they will believe in the message with which Allah sent them and by means of which he supported them, such as the splitting of the moon and the sending down of the Qur'an, which is the greatest Mu'ajah ever bestowed upon a messenger as well as the grieving of the palm tree stump, which the Prophet Sallallahu used as a minbar until the minbar was meant, was built for him. The springing up of the water from between his fingers and many other miracles. The Karama is an extraordinary event that Allah causes to occur at the hands of his believing close friends, Awliya or such as knowledge, power, and so on, and such as the shade that used to come under Usaid ibn al Hudayr when he recited Quran and the shining of light for Abbas ibn Bishr and Usaid ibn Hudayr when they left the Prophet Wasallam, and when they separated, there was light for each of them at the end of his whip. And these are all things that you find in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For it to be regarded as a karama, it is stipulated that the one at whose hands this, mirror, this karama occurs should strictly adhere to Islam and follow Sharia. If it doesn't sound and look like Islam, it's not a karama, it is something from the shayateen to delude you, or the jinn, or the sorcerer, or the witch. If that is not the case, these extraordinary things result from the power of devilish work. Karama does not happen for every Muslim. And that does not mean that that Muslim, that it does not happen for lacks faith because Karama only happens for specific reasons, such as the following. 
it happens out of the grace and mercy of Allah as a wajal to strengthen one's iman and to make them steadfast. Many scholars say that we should not pray for this because maybe we cannot handle it. Maybe it will be too much for us. Many Sahaba did not see karama because of their faith strength and absolute certainty. They didn't need to see it. They saw the messenger of Allah to establish proof against the enemy as happened to Khalid when he ate poison. He was besieging a fortress and they refused to yield until he ate the poison. So he ate it and then conquered it. A similar thing happened to Abu Idris al Kaulan when al Aswad al Ansi met him in the fire, and Allah saved him from that because he needed that karama. karama. We see something similar in the story of Um Ayman when she set out to migrate to Medina and became extremely thirsty. She was on her hijra. She heard a sound above her and lifted her head and she saw a bucket of water. She drank from it and it was taken away. Karama may be a test or trial. Some people may be blessed and others may be doomed. The one in whose hands it happens may be blessed if they give thanks for it or they may be doomed if they are filled with self-admiration and do not admire or adhere to righteousness or admire the one who gave it. And this is why we have to be very careful talking about parama because people will think we are special and that can feed our ego. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, May Allah have mercy on him was asked, how can we differentiate between Mu'ajiza, Karama, and Kahana, which is called sorcery? He replied, the Mu'ajiza is for the prophets, the Karama is for the close friends of Allah, the Aliyah of Ar-Rahman, and Kahana is for the close friends of the shayateen. Nowadays, a muajiza cannot occur because the messenger, blessing and peace of Allah be upon all of them, was the last of the prophets. Karama happened at the time of the messenger and may occur after this, his time, until the day of resurrection, it may occur at the hands of a righteous close friend of Allah. If we know that the person at whose hand a karama occurred is a righteous man or woman who fulfills their duties towards Allah and Allah's slaves, then we know that it is indeed a karama. We should look at the person If this so-called miracle, we use this word very loosely in the world, comes from a kahin, a soothsayer, that is a person who is not righteous, then we know it comes from the devil. The devil sometimes help the sons of Adam to achieve what they want. Why do you think that the big shayateen are locked up in the month of training, in the month of Ramadan? to help us recognize what is our self versus what kind of power is coming from another source or perhaps even the power of our own heart because of its ignorance. Sorcery, the miracle of the saints or the moages of the saints and the miracles of the prophets are all related to the power of the human spirit. Though there are many differences among them. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu Allah ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Transcended are you, O Allah, and praise be to you as you praise yourself. 
I bear witness that there is no deity save you, Allah. I seek your forgiveness and I seek repentance only from you.